We're in the middle of a series and the discussion uh, as a church. Um, we're calling the series, I Don't Get It. Because um, whether you are someone who has uh, read the Bible in full or uh, attempted to read the Bible in full, um, whether you have dug into Bible studies, whether or not um, you just may be one of those people that you grew up in church and you kind of heard things, uh, on some, most of the time, every one of us in our journey, you're going to come across something in Scripture that's going to cause you to pause for a moment to try to understand it, and because of our Western American, North American, uh, you know, uh, mentality and the way we think about things, sometimes we, we just can't relate. We don't understand why that's there. We don't understand what it means. We don't understand why it's important to us as believers. And so um, that's what this series is all about. We're kind of breaking it up into some sections to, to talk about. Um, and so uh, today, the theme for the series is this, and, I, and I'll share a little bit more about the big picture of this in just a minute. But this is Paul writing to his disciple, uh, Timothy. In this second letter, he says, all scripture is inspired, as Shin started us off like we, he used the NIV person, which is God breathed, same words as the, as the Old Testament, kind of, it's the idea that God breathed these things into existence through people. It's inspired by God and useful, Okay useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is right and wrong in our lives. It, can, it corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it, the scripture, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now remember, Paul did not assume that he was writing scripture. This is not an arrogant statement to say that what he's writing is, he's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the, the Jewish scripture. He's saying all of this, even though we're not Jewish, even though we are following Jesus, we want to see the way, we want to interpret it the way Jesus interpreted the Old Testament. And all of it is God breathed. All of it is there and is useful. I don't know about you, but there are many years in my life uh, as a Christian. I don't know if I could have said the Old Testament was all that useful, Right? especially some of the stuff written in it. And if you go to certain churches or, or been around certain teaching, uh, some of them will discount the, the Old Testament and kind of focus solely on the New Testament because in all fairness, the New, New Testament is the new covenant in terms of Jesus, right? We'll talk about that today. So it's important, but here's Paul saying, no, it's, it's important because it can teach us. It can equip us. It's beneficial. So last week we talked about what we don't get about the big book of wrath, right? The big book of death. We don't understand the genocide. We don't understand the injustice. We don't understand the, the, the number of lives that were taken either by God or in his name or whatever the case is. Like, like Shin walked us through all of that because we don't like to think about the wrath of God and the death that comes from the consequence of sin. So death, so Shin walked us through that last week. You have to go back and, 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 and watch that all by itself. It was phenomenal. Today, we're gonna talk about the book of rules, right? This is a big book of rules. I don't know if you were ever raised in a church that, that was kind of the focus on it, but many, many people view, especially the Old Testament, as just a big book of rules, big book of law, right? Now, this really wasn't as big a deal 50 years plus ago and before because only Christians knew what was in the book, right? So you understand that 50 plus years ago, Unless you were raised in church, right? Or you went to a revival or whatever the case is. Like, you didn't really know all the rules. So you didn't know what they were unless you were a Christian, unless you were a part of the family of God. You, and then you invested time to read and learn what the rules are. However, as I talked about in a couple series ago, you don't have, that's not the case anymore, right? You don't have to read the Bible to know what else is in the Bible. Okay? That's what the internet's for. Okay? That's what people want to do when they leverage this weird, uh, you know, this weird sentence and this weird verse, and they grab it out of the Old Testament and throw it in your face and say, what about this? What about this? What about this God? What do you do with that? Well, again, we didn't have to worry about that before. We do now. And so there's a lot of things, whether you read it because you're digging in or whether uh, someone's brought it to your attention, there are a lot of, there are a lot of things. Okay? I'm just going to give you a few examples. There's a lot of things we don't get. And so just to let you know, 
I've kind of broken the message up into three parts. The first part, I'm going to roll through rather quickly, okay? And there's a reason for that. First and foremost, you're all highly intelligent people if you're tuned in and you're part of Journey. Just praise you, okay? You're highly intelligent people. All right, second reason is is that our medium age has dropped because of all the children in the room and all the children watching online. And so don't get mad at me with what's in scripture, but I am doing my very best this morning to kind of soft some things up, soften some things up that I am gonna have to address in terms of rules and we'll move very quickly through them. So if you're parents and you get nervous, just, just know I'm, I'm going to go through this first section fairly quickly. All right? But there are some things that are just, we don't get it. Okay? Here's one, in case anybody threw this at you, from Leviticus 19. It says, don't mate two different kinds of animals. That sounds right. You know? Of course, that would throw all of our dogs out of, out of, out of the picture in terms of all the breeds we have. Do not plant your field with two different kinds of seed. Okay? Do not wear clothing woven from two different kinds of thread. Is that really a rule? Like, does that make sense? No poly blend for you, right? (laughs) That doesn't make any sense. Here's another one. This one's in Deuteronomy. If two Israelite men get into a fight... And the wife of one of them tries to grab, dress you her husband by grabbing the secrets, had to pull that from the KJV, of the other man, you must cut off her hand and show her no pity. That's, a, that's what you want us to do, right? Now, that's a really out there situation, but that's prison rules, am I right? Like, that's what that is. So there's lots of things you can run across or people can bring you that just, I don't get that. I don't get why that's there. Here's one from Jesus. As Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount took some of the Old Testament, you know, uh, uh, laws and started talking about the, the gravity of them. Jesus said, you've heard it said to our ancestors, we're told, you must not commit murder, right? That's one of the big 10. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. And then Jesus says, I say, if you're even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. Oh, if you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. How many times have you done that on Facebook this week alone? You know, or traffic, now that we apparently have traffic again. How many of you, I mean, just think about that. If you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Now, most of you don't think you curse anybody, but the reality is, is that if there's any hatred in your heart, if there's any hatred in your heart to a political person, to a, a leader, if there's a hatred in your heart towards other people that have wronged you, if there's hatred in your heart, That's cursing them. That's what he's talking about. And so here Jesus is saying, oh, hey, you thought this one little, you know, this one thing meant this, but here's what it really means. Here's what the rule really looks like. Now, one of the reasons we have to address all this is because if you don't know your word, if you do not know the word of God, then when you're having conversations with people that want to know, okay, wait, just why all the rules? Like, why do we have so many rules in Scripture? If you don't know why they were written, how they were written, the, the, the way to interpret those things, then ultimately you can read any one of those verses and have a very difficult time trying to, what you feel like you have to do, which is defend the Bible or defend God. Critics have really, in the last decade or so, There's been an unrelenting, just attack on the Old Testament, especially when it comes to rules and regulations. Um, There's a group called the New Atheists. They've been around for a little bit more than a decade or so. That This is a newer group, uh, 10 or 20 years. They're taking two things. They're taking full advantage of the fact that most Christians don't know the Bible. And they're taking advantage of these rules, these obscure verses, these obscure things that you don't know how to read and you don't know how to interpret them in order to cause division, in order to cause doubt. And people. Matter of fact, after 9 11, when many people were turning to church, right, turning to religion, um, Richard Dawkins, who's one of the leaders of the New Atheists, he actually wrote a book specifically for this fact called The God Delusion. Now, I don't encourage anyone here to read it, I've read most of it. It's called The God Delusion, and it is a full out attack on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in terms of religions. I'll read you just a little bit of a quote just to get an idea of what this book does in terms of the attack it makes on Christianity. It says, 
The great unmentionable evil at the center of our culture is monotheism, believing in a God. From the barbaric Bronze Age text known as the Old Testament, three anti-human religions have evolved. He talks about Judaism and Islam and Christianity. When he goes into Judaism, he says, originally it's a tribal cult of a singly fierce, a single fiercely unpleasant God, morbidly obsessed with sexual restrictions, with the smell of charred flesh. And he goes on to talk about sacrifices and demands and just obscure Old Testament things that have context to them. But in terms of which he's sort of throwing out this idea that this Judaism, this, this, this evil text called the Old Testament is not even worth looking into. It's the worst thing that our world could see. And he goes on and on and on about that. But I have to, listen, we have to take time to understand. And I don't have all the time in the world today, so I'm going to kind of break this up. You have to understand why did God give the rules that he did? Now, one of the biggest things you see in the Old Testament is the Sinai Covenant, right? The Ten Commandments plus the Levitical Code, the Levit Levitical Law. I'm just going to take about five minutes to address a couple of things just so that you understand. It's going to require you to do some work if you want to fully understand, but I'm going to give you just the, the, the Matt Dawson cliff notes of a couple things today as examples, okay? One of the things that gets sort of attacked is sort of the, all the restrictions that God places on intimate behavior, Okay? All these restrictions. As a matter of fact, if you go to Leviticus 18, I can't read them all. You go look at Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18 has 19 different things that are prohibited, okay, in the, in the Sinai covenant, in the law. And what you will notice after a while, especially if you understand the context, that 17 of those 19, right, they are pro that were prohibited. They are right now, today, illegal or frowned upon. Like 17 of the 19 today in, all, in countries across the world are illegal or frowned upon. And if you go read it for yourself, you will understand. There were, I mean, beyond the time in which the actual, the actual law was given to the Israelites, they were ahead of their time in terms of the laws given to them by, by God. The, the things that, that, that were, all 19 of these were practiced in Egypt all 19 were practiced in, their, in, their, in the 400 plus years they were enslaved to Egypt. It'd be centuries, guys, centuries through the Romans beyond that many things were still practiced. And yet here's this covenant, this law that was given to God's people, okay? Given to God's people to help them live in freedom and in the fullness of the life that God had for them. They were a slave nation. All they knew were slave laws. God needed to give them a civil and moral code to help them experience God and to experience freedom in a new life, as a new nation, in a new land that God was going to give them. It was superior in every way compared to any other nation at that time. Matter of fact, one of the things that most people don't understand is that the protections afforded the most vulnerable in the Jewish law out was revolutionary in comparison to every other culture at that time. Women were better protected, had more rights. Foreigners, servants, children, all fared better under the Jewish law at that time. Now, we, we read some of it now, and we can't, in our civilized mind, oh, well, why, ah, why would God do? You have to understand. God was taking a slave people and explaining the best he could how to move from where they were into freedom, into the fullness of what God wanted for them. But it was going to require rules. It was going to require law. That's why it's called the law. Now, I want to just kind of quickly go over this, but it's understanding the difference in terms of the law itself, the purpose behind rules. So rule-based systems, as a matter of fact, this comes from a study that Tracy and I just did with a group in our church called Starting Point, and we'll probably do another one this fall. Uh, but th in one of our sessions as we taught our group, our small group, um, this is one of the examples that I felt like was very helpful. So that's what I'm going to give it to you this morning. It's called Starting Point. It's from a church in Atlanta, and it's a phenomenal study. But when it comes to understanding the law and the rule-based systems, you have to just think about it in these sort of modern terms, right? 
There's the family model of rules, right? Every, all the parents in the room, nod your head, yes? All the parents online, you have children, okay? They have rules. Some of you guys even have them listed in your house called the rules of the house. Nod your head. If you're with me, yes. There's unspoken rules. There's spoken rules. There's rules that are spoken over and over and over and over again, right? Though the family model are rules for the family. How many parents have said this? I don't care what little Jimmy does down the street. I don't care what little Jimmy's parents said, right? These are our rules. <laughs> this is our family. The family model means that you're a part of the family and there are rules because you're a part of this family. In comparison, the club model is that there are rules for you to follow if you would like to be a part of the club. And then I, we put this up here. This is a fun one. The HOA rules, which is rules you don't know exist <laughs> until you break them. You guys right? Okay. They're rules that you just don't know. You know they're rules, but you really don't know it until you break it that you broke a rule. And these are models of rule-based systems. And, and I just want to walk you through this very quickly, just to understand this in terms of how we read scripture, how we see the rules, in, especially in the Old Testament. Secular, rule-based systems, they're bound to change and make exceptions. They're bound to change and make exceptions. And oftentimes, you'll know that you're in a club or an HOA model of rules. If there's constant tension as the world changes, as culture changes, as people change, there will be tension that you feel like the rules have to change. And if they don't change, exceptions. Well, yeah, but that's the rule, but this. Yeah, that's the rule, but right? The rule-based systems, especially the club and the HOA, like there's no choice. They are bound to have to make exceptions or to change rules based on how people change and how culture changes. God's rules, okay? I've, now you've heard me say this before, Journey. God's rules are ideals and instructions. They are the ideals and instructions for his family because it's a family model. Ideals don't, doesn't mean like ideal, like would it, wouldn't it be great if, and wouldn't it be great if Adam and Eve didn't screw it all up, you know, wouldn't it be amazing? That's not what I mean by ideal. Ideals meaning that God created you. He created the world. He created the systems that are in the world. No one knows better how you need to be you in the systems he created than him, right? That's what ideals mean. He gives us the ideals that says, if you want, I mean, excuse the, the phrase of like, if you want to experience your best life, if you want to experience the fullness of what God wants you to experience, guess who knows how to navigate that life? God does. Here are the guides. Here are the rules. Here are the instructions to help you get there. Everybody with me? Nod your head, yes? All right. You feel free to say amen anytime you want, by the way. That's the kind of church we are. Now, these are, God, these are ideals and instructions, right? That's what it is. Ideals and instructions. When we, feel, when we start living in church world, and maybe, you, maybe this is some of your story. You know, I, you, you heard the rules. You heard the church say certain things. And you thought it was a family model because that's what the Bible says it is. But everybody sort of acted like it was the club model, Right? Everybody around you is acting like, well, if you don't follow the rules, you're out. If you don't follow the, the this, some churches, you know, they'll just flat out be like, we don't know all the rules, but God will let us know if we break them, right? If we go too far, God will let us know. They kind of work in the HOA model. No, God's ideals and instructions and rules are given, and they are rules. Don't, don't get me wrong. They're rules, but they're not, they're not based on that secular rule-based system that has to change. God's ideals and instructions are timeless. They are timeless for every generation, for every culture. They have been timeless. Now, the, an understanding of interpretation of the context is needed, especially when it comes to some of the Old Testament law. But whether it's by good example or bad example, or by directive where God said, do this, don't do that, Paul told Timothy, we can learn 
from the scriptures. That the scriptures can equip us, equip us with those ideals and instructions to live in the fullness of what God has for us. This is the last part of that section that we, 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 went, we went over in um, starting point, is just to remember that before any rules were given, before any rules were given, God had already established the relationship with his people. You see this in Exodus 20. Exodus 20, if you ever want to go read the, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, that's where you go, okay? God gave the people these instructions. But before he gave them any instructions, he said, I am the Lord, your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. This is God basically saying, hey, I want to give you some instructions, but this is a reminder that we're in the family model. I am the Lord, your God. Meaning that before you chose me, I chose you. Who rescued you out of slavery. Who rescued you out of Egypt, out of your place of slavery. This is God saying that, he's just basically saying, look, before you do anything for me, before you've done anything for me, I was doing something for you. Because there's a relationship there. Right? And then, so after he establishes that, then he says, you must have no other gods but me. Then he says, then he gives the Ten Commandments. Then he passes out the Sinai Covenant through Moses. The civil and moral code. Before any of that, he established and reminded them that this is not the club rules. Like, hey, I'm looking for a people. Here's the list. Anybody want to want to join that club? Just come follow these rules. You break one, you're out. No, the Ten Commandments, and this is where, where we talked about this as a group. The Ten Commandments were a confirmation of, not a condition of, Israel's relationship with God. Everything that, that, the, that the critics are going to argue with you about in terms of the rules and how crazy those things are and why would anybody believe, we understand through the context of how it's written, why it's written, and interpreting it that, look, these rules were necessary. This law was necessary for the big picture because of what Christ was going to come do and fulfill the law. But these rules are necessary, but it was a confirmation of the relationship the Heavenly Father had with his people. Not a condition of it. Not the condition to get it. So that's something I want you to remember is that God's rules... God's rules always assumes a relationship. Let's all read it out loud together, nice and loud, so the people online can hear you, okay? Let's read this statement. God's rules always assumes a relationship. One more time, read it out loud. God's rules always assumes a relationship. God's rules always assume that there's a relationship in play. Because for God, rules preceded, I mean, relationship preceded the rules, Right? He had his people before he required his people to do anything, to follow anything, to do anything, to, to obey anything. It was a confirmation of his love and his rescuing, his provision, that they could trust him before, and not really the conditions of, right? It's very important, you need to remember. And guys, this is why, okay, understand when we understand that, this is why people had such a hard time with Jesus, okay? Now, in Jesus' day, I'm not going to try to compare him to today and what he would be like today. I don't know, okay? But in Jesus' day, the people of God continued, from the time of Moses to Jesus, continued to take the rules and turn them into the club model and not the family model. They wanted the security of the family model that were God's people, but they constantly treated the Israelite people like it was a club or the HOA. Okay? The Pharisees just walked around the neighborhood looking for who was screwing up. Everybody nod your head if you're with me, right? That's HOA. Not that I'm bitter or anything like that. That's what they did. They constantly took the law. They took the, the rules that were in the, because of the relationship with God, they took the rules and tried to make them a club that you got to do all of these things. You have to do them. 
in order to be in. So Jesus comes along and says, I'm just, he, Jesus lived under the law, but constantly kept expressing to them, mm -mm, it's about the relationship. It's about the relationship that God has with you. It's about the relationship through me that I'm going to have with you, that the rules even make a difference, that the rules even matter. And so we see this engagement, right? We see this engagement with the, 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 the brightest of the bright, the, te the, the scholars, if you will, of the law come up to Jesus, and they want to know from this rabbi, this teacher, one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with a question. Ooh, we're going to get Jesus this time, right? He's not going to be able to answer this one. Teacher, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? There's 613, just to remind you, 613 in the Sinai Covenant. Jesus replied, simple, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then he said this, he threw him a little monkey wrench and he says, the second is equally important, meaning that there's more than this, but they're equal in importance, meaning I can't give you one, I have to give you two as one. I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, the, the, and this is in Matthew, the Hebrew context of as yourself is, is coming from the old Hebrew, which is as much as yourself, okay? As much as you love you, I want you to love your neighbor. And then he says the entire law, everybody with me? 613, the entire law. And all the demands of the prophets, meaning the prophets that came along and kept saying, you got to remember, you got to remember, you got to remember, they're based on these two commandments. There's a word in there that means hinge. They hinge on it, meaning the door doesn't open, right, without these two things. Like the laws, the laws don't matter because they can be placed in these two statements as the summary or the fullness of the law. Matter of fact, I'll jump over to Paul says the same thing to the church in Galatia because, you know, all of Paul's letters, the church kept forgetting. They kept making it a club versus a family. You know, well, God loves you, but you, you got to get circumcised. You know, I mean, it's just one of those like, oh, you got to follow the rule. So he kept making it a club and Paul's there like, no, 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 this is a family model. The ideals and instructions are important. The whole law can be summed up in this one command of love your neighbor as yourself, as much as yourself. Now, the easy way to remember this is this. Again, going back to the to, to, to way Jesus was describing it. The great commandment that Jesus gives, again, is relationship. It's based in relationship. Love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself. The best way to visualize this is a cross. There's a vertical component to it. Love God, there's not a whole lot for us to do other than love God because he did everything for us, right? So this isn't, this isn't a huge effort. This is just us responding back to him. This is where we live. This is the plane we're on, horizontal. You're gonna love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. I don't know about you, I love me, okay? You might not be as honest. I'm amazing, right? <laughs> And so as much as I love me, Jesus has made it crystal clear that all the law, all the rules come through the filter that I love my neighbor as much as I love me. Now, they were a little confused, so Jesus had to give them a little story and tell them who their neighbor was, right? They may remember this story, yeah? The guy gets robbed on the side of the road, the pastor goes by and crosses over, doesn't help. The little church, good church people go by, crosses over the road street, doesn't help. Then a despised Samaritan comes by and has compassion. Jesus is sitting there saying, look, I'm, I'm going to remind you guys, this is so important that I'm going to make it so crystal clear that I'm going to remind you who your neighbor is. And just using that description of the Samaritan, he's like, your neighbor is this. Your neighbor is the people who don't look like you. They don't look like you. They're not from where you're from. 
right? Tell me how it's possible that there's any racism among the children of God. Did Jesus not make it clear who our neighbor is? That they don't look like you. They're not from where you're from. You're supposed to love them as much as you love you. They don't think like you think. They don't have the same worldview that you have. Okay? All those rioters and looters, your neighbor. I know nobody's going to amen this, but just let me get through it, okay? All those people who hate this country, they're your neighbor. All those who, who do have racism just boiling and prejudice boiling up in them, they're your neighbor. You're, you're called to love them. Love them as much as you love you. They don't look like you. They don't think like you. And guess what? They don't believe what you believe. Okay? They don't believe what you... They do not worship the same God. They do not believe what you believe. This is Pride Month, people. All your Facebook and your social media and your conversations are going to be around the LGBTQ and, and they're going to be they're, they're going to be the activists and the supporters in your life. And they're your neighbor. They are. They're your neighbor. Like there's He made it so clear. They don't believe what you believe. Those Republicans are your neighbor. Those Democrats are your neighbor. Those socialists are your neighbor. Those people who think that you should be wearing masks, they're your neighbor. Those people who think this whole thing's a conspiracy, they're your neighbor. And what are we supposed to do? What's the word? Love. Love. Mm, yeah, yeah. You're not too loud right now, I understand. <laughs> you guys understand that Jesus had to make this so, so clear crystal clear that the relationship starts before the rules matter. It's a relationship with God. It's how we love others. It's how we love our neighbors who don't think, look like us, who don't think like us, who don't believe like us. And you know, there's Christians, probably none of you, I'm not going to even pick on you, okay? But there's Christians out there Listen, it's true. There are Christians out there who like to take the rules of God and like to use them to judge people. And they like to use them to create distance between us and them. How dare someone use the rules of God that were established for the relationship of his people, for the love of him, and to love our neighbor. And you're using the rules, you're using rules that they don't care about and they're not interested in and a God they don't know. Whose rules, they're not, the rules aren't for them. You're going to use those rules as an excuse not to love them? Although Jesus made it really clear. And if you're thinking, because I know that's not you, okay, there's nobody in the room that's like that. If you're thinking, just maybe, I don't know if I can do that, Matt. I don't know if I can do that. Guys, welcome to a faith that needs Jesus Christ. Okay? Welcome to a faith, right, that needs the power of Christ in you daily working through you. If you could do it naturally, if you could do it on your own, you'd already be doing it. So when you have that tension that says, oh, and you're thinking about that person right now on social media, you've already unfollowed them. Somehow they got back in your feed. And you've all but cursed them. You, you've definitely called them an idiot. And now you're sitting there saying, I have to love them as much as I love me. And that tension that's in you that says, I can't do it. I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, welcome to the faith. Welcome to faith in Jesus Christ, in which we need daily the Holy Spirit in us to be able to live that love out through us. Here's the problem. I'll get off this very quickly and close this out. Relationships, or rules without relationships, is irrelevant. And I know, I know that you're not there yet. I don't expect you to be there today. 
But the rules of God, God's rules, his ideals and instructions, without the relationship is irrelevant. It's irrelevance to people who don't know him, who are not interested in him. And yet how long has the church tried to be the moral police of the world, trying to get all the laws and all the common cultural things kind of moved in the direction so that we don't have to be the light, the government can be the light, right? We don't have to be the ones who love others because everybody just gets in line and does what you're supposed to do. And nobody's amening this one, I know, I'm just, I'm, I know, it's tough. And yet we continue to push the rules of God on people that don't care and are not interested. They're not, they're not, they're, the rules aren't for them. The rules are for you, for me. Paul tells the church in Corinth because he's, he's laying down some heavy, heavy um, 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 dis- guidance on how to deal with somebody in the church in Corinth, and he tells them, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Paul's like, that's none of my business. Are you not to judge those inside? Are the people who are the followers of God not the ones that are accountable to the rules of God? God will judge those outside. God's got it covered. He doesn't need our help. Judgment's coming for all of us, guys. Praise God for Jesus and grace on the cross. Judgment's coming. He's got it covered for those who do not want to bow a knee, for those who do not believe, for those who have rejected him. Judgment is coming. God's got it covered. He did not give us any commands to go and judge our neighbors. He gave us the command to go and love our neighbors. Right? Why? Because we're accountable to the ideals and instructions of God, which helps us, helps us help people understand that there is an absolute hope for their life. There is a power, there's a power source that can help them live in the freedom and fullness that God wants for them, right? There's an identity that they're searching and striving for that can be found in Jesus. We sing the song, right? He's the way maker, he's the miracle worker, he's the promise keeper, that's who he is. Our job is to love our neighbors so that people can see it, so that people can experience it, so that people can just enjoy that part of it through the church. The darker the world gets, I'm not concerned. It's the brighter the light of the church can become. And yet, if we don't know why the rules are there, we don't know that the rules are for us, we think they're for everybody, we're going to continue to expect people to behave like they know God when they don't. And there's no relationship. I'll close with this. This is Jesus through his covenant. This is his last supper. He's talking with the guys. He drinks the cup. He says, this is a covenant I'm making in my blood. They don't truly yet have an understanding of what he's getting ready to do. And he gives them this new command. He said, I'm giving you a new commandment to love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're mine, that you're my disciples. Now, a lot of people confuse this verse with the other verse, and you should not confuse it. The, 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 the summary of the law, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor, the ones who don't look like you, think like you, and believe like you, as yourself, as much as they, you love you, is the command, is the rule. It's what we are accountable to. The new command that comes from Christ is to his family and says, hey, family, listen up. Just like I am going to love you, I'm going to lay down my life for you. I'm going to take on the weight of all your sin. I'm going to sacrifice it all for you. Just as I've loved you, that's the way you're supposed to love one another. So the family, the family rule 
isn't just that we're called to love our neighbors. Oh, there's a, there's a rule there for us as the church, as followers of Christ, to love one another sacrificially. Because, again, that's how the world gets to know that you're mine. They do not know that you're mine when you judge them with rules that they don't care about. They do not know that you're mine when you try to leverage everything you can to try to legislate morality in this world so that it's just easier for you and your family to not be so worried about how bad things are around you. Yeah, that's not how they know. They know that you're mine by the way you love one another. That's the new command. In addition to the great commandment that was the summary of 613 laws to help us live the life he's called us to live. Let me pray for us, but let me just give you this last slide to help you see it. Just remember, when you don't get it, there's a reason for it. When you read something and you don't get it, there's a reason for it. The ideals and instructions of God were to help his people live freedom, live a full life in freedom. And what he's asked of us is a confirmation of the fact that we belong to him. We get to call him Abba Father, not a conditional thing. You know, loving your neighbor, I know it's hard, it's not a condition of how of any gold stars you get with God and how you're doing. It needs to come from your relationship with him and to others. That's the only place it comes from. And we need Jesus to do it. But always remember when you read those rules, when you start having an argument, there's not even a good summertime vacation maybe. At your summertime vacation, when you get into your argument with your sister-in-law and your brother-in-law and your, 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 your son's girlfriend and they, and they start arguing about these things that they just want to pull out of the Bible, just take a breath, say, Jesus, I need you, and then respond, helping them understand that there's a reason for the rules. There is. But it first and foremost is a relationship with him that affects how we love our neighbors and how we love one another. Let's pray. God, your word is so clear, sometimes it's, it's so bothersome for us because we don't get to hide in the complexity that we enjoy. That God, when you made it clear who our neighbor was, when you made it clear the summary of the law, when you made it clear that even though there are rules we don't get the full context of, we don't fully understand, that we can look to what Jesus said and how Jesus told us to live, and we can look at that, and it's just, it's like a mirror, God. And we fail in that comparison. We, we fail so often in what you've called us to do and commanded us to do and what we're actually doing. And yet, Jesus, you told us that that was kind of intentional. That's the way it was supposed to be because the mirror of your word that gives freedom and liberty is only able, it's only able to do it when we have you in us. So God, I just thank you today. I thank you that through your spirit, you're able to empower your people to love you to love those who don't think and look and believe like us. And God, to love one another as the church, the body of Christ, so that people will know that we're yours. It's only by your power, it's only by your grace that we can step in and experience what you've called us to experience. And yet, God, thank you for today, just a time in which we, we can be honest about the things we don't get, and yet, God, be challenged by your word to still step in by faith with you to live out what you've called us to do. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.